All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Daily Power Parasha. Today is Monday, June 20th, 2022. And we are starting a brand new Torah portion this week. Torah portion this week is Shlach, Shlach Lucha Anashim. It's all about the spies. This Torah portion is absolute bonkers in a good way. By the way, that's totally respectful. Like it's it's like totally amazing and dramatic and heartbreaking and devastating and, and just like it's all over the place. There's so much to talk about and so many life lessons that we can learn from the narrative, from the drama, from the story. So let's just jump in without further ado. I'm going to share my screen and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's let's do DPP. Torah reading for Shlach. I always find it interesting when um, Chabad.org has a different spelling for Shlach than it does for Shlach right above it. You notice that? Shlach, shlach. I feel like it's highlights. What's different? The E. Anyway, shelach or shlach, either way, that's the name of this week's Torah portion. And shlach means send. Send. Because this week, the main drama circles around the sending of the spies, the miraglim, to scout out the land of Israel. Oh, <laughs> before we jump in, I feel like I always do this. But before we jump in to the text, I need to give you a quick hakdam, a quick intro. And that is that the Jewish people had, I'm just doing a quick recap of the history. They had gone out of Egypt, received the Torah, sinned with the golden calf, built the Mishkan, inaugurated the Mishkan, and it was now about a year, give or take a year plus after the Exodus. So this would have been, Somewhere in the month of when did he send the spies? The spies were those days they came back on Shavos of Tammuz. So that would have been Tammuz 17 minus 23 days would be um, Sivan. Somewhere in Sivan. So about a year and a month after the Exodus. So about 13 months. Just I feel like this is helpful. 13 months after the Exodus, the Jews were finally, they finally left the area of Mount Sinai. They had been there and that's where all that, all of the above uh, mentioned item, um, incidents has happened, including the giving of the Torah, the breaking of the tablets, the sin of the, sin of the golden calf, the building of the Mishkan, the inauguration of the tabernacle. All that stuff happened around the Sinai, uh, around the Sinai desert, around Mount, Mount Sinai. They had finally taken their first journey. And as we read in last week's Torah portion, they went a, a, a journey of three days. And at this point, the plan was, Let's put this in a dashed line. The plan was to go into the land of Israel. That was it. It was a year after the Exodus. And the plan at this point was to go into the promised land. That's it. Well, we know what happens next. What happens next is they, they wander for thir 40 years, but another 39 years. So what happens? This is what happens. Let's read this Torah portion. All right. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Shlach lecha anashim, send out for yourself men who will scout the land of, Can of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. In other words, send men to scout. What's what's what vas meant scout? What does scout mean? I'm throwing Yiddish in the mix, right? What's the what's the meaning of the word scout? Somebody says, "Oh, I'm going to scout this out." It means check it out. You know, get get a little intel. Check it out. So scout out, send men to scout out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. You shall send one man each for his father's tribe. Each one shall be a chieftain in their midst. So basically, it's going to be one scout per tribe, not including Levi. The, the Levites were not part of this. They were not army eligible. They were not scout eligible. They were not... They had their own census. They were just their own category. So then who were the 12, 12 tribes? You only have 11 tribes. As we know, Joseph. Yosef had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and that's where each one gets counted as their own tribe, Manasseh and Ephraim, or Ephraim and Manasseh. Hence, you have 12 tribes and 12 chieftains, 12 tribal leaders that will be the scouts to go and check out the land of Canaan, which will eventually become the land of Israel. Okay, so far, so good. By the way, 
The first uh, and obvious question is, what does it mean when God says to Moses, send out for yourself? Send out for yourself. What does that mean? In Hebrew, it's shlach lecha. Shlach lecha. What's the lecha? It should just say send out. Men, what's for yourself? For yourself seems like a bit of a weird turn of phrase. Again, I just highlighted in blue on the English side. Imagine that's missing. I wish I had a, like a black highlighter or a white highlighter. Send out men who will scout the land. What's the problem? Send out for yourself. Lecha? What's lecha? We'll get there. Rashi is going to give us a, an incredible insight. We'll get there soon. Um, so, so far we know that God is telling Moses to send out scouts to check out the land. 12 of them, one per tribe. So, verse 3, Moses, so Moses sent them from the desert of Paran. That's where they, that's where they were. By the way, the desert of Paran is right by the border of Israel. So he sent them from the desert of Paran by the word of the Lord. All of them, listen to this, all 12 scouts were men of distinction. They were the heads of the children of Israel. They were leaders. It's interesting in the Hebrew, it says kulam anashim. Kulam anashim. Anashim means men. They were all men. But according to the way we understand it, it means they were all men of distinction. They were all men deserving of being called men. Called men. And they were the heads. Who were they? Who were these 12? Who were these 12 scouts? Here we go. These are their names. For all time. For pep, for What's the word? Um, perpetuity. Perpetuity. Whatever. We have their names. For the tribe of Reuben. Shamua, the son of Zakor. For the tribe of Shimon, Shaphat, the son of Chori. For the tribe of Yehuda, Judah, Kalev, the son of Yefuna. For the tribe of Yisachar, Yigal, the son of Yosef. The tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. The tribe of Benjamin, Pal Palti, the son of Rafu. For the tribe of Zavulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi. For the tribe of Joseph, for the tribe of Menashe. Remember, Joseph has two. Uh, Gadi, the son of Susi. The tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali. For the tribe of Asher, Sisur, the son of Michal. The tribe of Naphtali, Nachbi, the son of Vofsi. The tribe of God, Guuel, the son of Machi. That's 12. These are the names, by the way, if anybody's ever looking for creative Hebrew names. There you go. It's a bunch of untapped potential. although. Maybe not, because 10 of them, as the story unfolds, spoiler alert, 10 of them come back with a negative report against the land. Anyway, these are the names of the men Moses sent to scout the land. Oh, and one more thing. Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua, Yehoshua. Basically, Moses changes the name of one of these guys. Who is he? This one right here. Tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. Moses changes his name from Hoshea to Yehoshua. In Hebrew, if you look at the Hebrew Hoshea, Hoshea, he added one letter, the Yud, Yeho, and then revalized, right? Yehoshua instead of Hoshea, Yehoshua, with an extra Yud at the beginning of the name. That's exactly what the Torah says. He changed Hoshea to Yeho, to Yehoshua. There's a tremendous Rashi on this, which we'll get to. But we're going to go through the narrative a little bit. What was their mission? What was their mission? What was their mandate? They are scouts. But what's their job? What are the parameters of their scouting mission? Moses sent them to scout the land of Canaan. And he said to them, here are the instructions. Listen carefully. He said to them, go up this way in the south and climb up the mountain. Approach from the south, climb up the mountain. You shall see what kind of land it is and the people who inhabit it. So check out the land and the inhabitants. Are they strong or weak? Are there few or many? These are relevant questions, especially if you're planning on conquering the land, right? The Jews are planning on taking it over. It would be wise to find out what's going on. Let's get some intel. And what of the land they inhabit? What about the land itself? Is it good or bad? And what are the cities in which they reside? 
Are they in camps or fortresses? In other words, are the cities open, which will make it easy to attack? Or are they with walls and fortresses, secure? What's going on in Canaan? You know, now, nowadays, you would just send a drone, maybe. Just get some aerial footage. Spend the, send the uh, spy plane. You know, just check out, check out the, uh, the aerials. Boots on the ground, baby. They sent 12 people. Check it out. And what is the soil like? What is the ground like? Is it fat or lean? I'm no expert in soil, but I'm pretty sure there's no fat or lean soil. But I mean, like what, what, what the stuff that it grows, I'm sure it means the growth. Is it fat or lean? Are there any trees in it or not? You shall be courageous. Courageous. And take from the fruit of the land. In other words, take some samples, bring it back. Moses like, hey, I heard good things about the, uh, the Jaffa oranges. Bring, uh, hook up a brother. No, but he's like, get, get some samples. Let's, uh, let's make it happen. And oh, FYI, the Torah fills in the info. This wasn't Moses' words to the spies, but the narrator of the Torah says it was the season when the first grapes begin to ripen. So it was, things were growing. Things were growing. All right, let's pause here for a moment. First of all, I don't know about you, I just get very excited about this Torah portion. There's so much drama that's about to happen. But even right now, I don't know the story. I, I, maybe I'm more of a narrative guy. Not that, I don't, not that I mind. I don't have no problem with like a list of mitzvot. Like do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. But I'm, I, I love the narrative. Like give me a narrative, I'm all in, right? So here we, got, we have a narrative. The Jewish people, finally, after hundreds of years of slavery, after... 400 years since the original promise of God to Abraham, 400 plus years from, from God's promise to Abraham that your descendants are going to inherit the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, the promised land. After all that we've been through as a people, finally, our nation is, is poised to enter the land. And there's one more step. Let's send in some scouts. Shlach lecha. Let's do Rashi. Let's do Rashi. Because Rashi will share with us some pretty interesting intel info. Send for yourself, men. So first of all, the first question Rashi deals with is one that he deals with on occasion, which is juxtaposition. Why is this narrative following the previous narrative at the end of last week's Torah portion? So Rashi asks this question. Why is the section dealing with the spies juxtaposed with the section dealing with Miriam? If you recall at the end of last week's Torah portion, the Torah tells us how Miriam was speaking to Aaron, her brother, about her other brother, Moses, and about Moses' marriage with his wife and separating from her and da-da-da and all that stuff. And then God says, uh-uh, not going to speak about somebody behind their back. Saras for you. And Miriam is afflicted with Saras, Sarat, and she is quarantined for seven days outside the camp. So Rashi asked the certainly rhetorical question, why is this story coming right after that story. Why are they, in the Torah, they're touching. I mean, we have, you know, when you start a new Torah portion, it almost feels like an island, but it's not. Look in the Torah, it's like back to back. Why these back to back stories? Because she was punished with Sarat over matters of slander for speaking against her brother. And these wicked people, you know who that refers to? The spies? These wicked people witnessed it but did not learn their lesson. Bum, 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 bum. What does that mean? They didn't learn their lesson. It means that these spies saw what happened to Miriam when she spoke against Moses, and yet that didn't for one second hold them back from speaking ill about the promised land. Where did they speak ill about the promised land? Okay, we haven't gotten yet to it in the narrative, but Rashi, Rashi knows that we flipped ahead a little bit. Rashi knows that it's, you know, he knows what's going on. He knows the score. You know, we can't hold ourselves back from flipping to the end of the story. So, yeah, the story gets ugly. It gets pretty ugly pretty fast. And Rashi's pointing out that, yeah, they didn't learn the lesson from Miriam. Don't speak bad against people or against God's promised land. It doesn't end well. Next, send for yourself, Rashi says. Why for yourself? And Rashi explains, l'cha means l'daitcha, according to your own understanding. God was not commanding Moses. He was saying, if you want, do it. I am not commanding you, says God to Moses, but if you wish, you may send. I won't stop you. 
Rashi then explains how this all came about. What Moses just decided unilaterally to send spies? What was he bored? No. Since the Israelites have come to Moses and said, let us send men ahead of us. It actually, this idea of sending scouts came from the people. They were the ones that said, let us send men. How do we know this? In Deuteronomy, it says, this. as it says, when Moses recounts the story to the people before his passing, he says, all of you approached me, dot, dot, dot. So it came from the people. So then Moses took counsel with the Shekhinah, with God. So God says, I told them that it's good. As it says, I will bring you, I will bring you up from the affliction of Egypt, dot, dot, dot. Meaning I'll take you from a bad place to a good place by their lives. Now it will give them the opportunity to err through the words of the spies so that they will not inherit it. In other words, let me explain Rashi very clearly. Let's explain the narrative. Here's the timeline of events. The people sense that the, the time is approaching. It's not, they're knocking on the door of the promised land. The people are getting a little bit nervous. They're getting a little bit, a little bit uneasy, a little bit anxious. They go to Moses and say, uh, we think it's a good idea to send spies so that we know what's going to happen when we, when we cross the border. We're going to go into Canaan, and then what? Who's there? Are they strong? Are they weak? Are they, the city's fortified? Are they open? What kind of land is it? Like, just what's going on? We're, we're getting nervous. We're getting anxious. So Moses says, all right, let me, let me ask God. And Moses says, God, they, they want me to send people to check out the land. Is it a good idea or not? What's God's answer? What does God say? You do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. I'm not going to tell you yes. I'm not going to tell you no. Do what you think is right. And, and you know what's, what's interesting about that answer? First time. First time. When has God told Moses, do whatever you want? Since the beginning, since the burning bush, since God first appears to Moses at the burning bush, when does God tell Moses, you know what? You, you handle it. You deal with it. Whatever you want, you decide. Since when does God not have an opinion? And in fact, God certainly does have an opinion. As Rashi just told us, God says, you know what? This thing is going to blow up and it's not going to, and it's going to be your fault. It's going to be your fault. All y'all's fault. People's fault, Moses' fault. You'll see. You'll see this thing will blow up. What is happening here? Seems like God knows it's a bad idea. So then why doesn't he tell Moses, don't do it? Is he afraid? You understand my question? I hope it's a clear question. The whole, the whole narrative doesn't make sense. And if, if you want to see specifically what I'm referring to, Rashi says that God tells Moses, do whatever you want. I am not commanding you. And, the, the, and, and the, 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 the sequence of events is the people approach Moses. Moses approaches God. And God says, do whatever you want. And then God muses to himself, I told them it was good. If they're questioning it, fine. It's going to end in disaster. So God knows it's not going to work out. So why does he tell Moses, go ahead or do whatever you want? Joy. He says, do whatever you want, but do it this way. Let the people take ownership of their decision and everybody participates in it. Good, good. But why now? What's going on? Why suddenly is God not telling, not dictating? Everything's been by the word of God. Everything's been per divine command. Every time there's been a question, God has said equivocally, this, yes or no. Suddenly God's like, do whatever you want. What's going on? I have an interesting note. Yeah. Uh, I have a note here that says the incident of Miriam took place in Hazeros. Rashi is of the opinion that the incident of Korach's dispute with Moses, which is the subject of chapter 16 below, also took place in Hazeros. Uh, the sin of the spies took place after the dispute of Korach, for they were sent from the wilderness of Paran, where the children of Israel encamped. In other words, uh, Korach, where where the ladies said we're, we're as good as a Kohen, we take use our fire pans. That, that was so. In other words, it's that that's what that, that's what this says here. That, that so that's even more. There's even more drama before this drama. Yeah, 
Shit. But again, I mean, yeah. But they're doing their own thing. That, no, that's you're saying they're doing their own thing. The Levi said, you know, the Korok said, we're, we're as good as the Kohanes. We're gonna, we, can, we can put our own fire. That's their word, not God's word. God right. said the land was good. They said, no, uh, we need to see if the land's good. So you're God is not enough theme. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Saying it's a similar theme. I'll, I'll share with you an insight that the Rebbe shares about this. And in my opinion, it's, um, it's really special. The Rebbe says, that what was happening. Second. Yeah. Hold on. I'm just muting to get a clean background. Um, the Rebbe explains that essentially there was a brand new stage happening right, right now, right at this point in time in history. It was moving from top down. To bottom up, and I think this is what this is kind of what we're we're all connecting with, right? It was moving from a top-down dictatorship essentially to a bottom-up ownership. As I think Joy said, own your decision, or maybe Mark said, or both of you said, right? Own own it. God is telling Moses, you own it. The people should own it for better or for worse. Why? Because that's the whole modality of the shift. See, until this point in time, you're being taken from Egypt, protected in clouds, fed miracle food, mana from heaven, a miraculous well of water is following you. Your clothes are dry cleaned in the cloud. See, even technology has not caught up yet. There's a lot of things that happen in the cloud, but not dry cleaning. I'm just saying, can't upload your clothes. But then, according to the Talmud, the clothes were cleaned. Some of the clouds cleaned the clothes. It's a whole thing. Um, anyway, so it was a miraculous existence, meaning everything was done for them. They were like, the example is like children that are being taken care of by their parents, like young children who are dressed and fed and transported, everything for them. But at a certain point, there comes a stage where the child is now ready, ready or not, it's now, now, now you got to make some decisions and they're not always going to work out. God is demonstrating, not demonstrating, God is modeling this idea of, I don't know what the right word is, I'm not facilitating of, well, basically letting go and creating a space for the other to now step into their, their, their own space, knowing full well that they may fail. Knowing full well that, you know what? Not may, I'm being nice. That they will fail. They'll make mistakes. But you know what? That's better in the long term than never letting them have the opportunity to fail. So quick example. You're teaching your kid or anyone really to ride a bike. And so they start off with the training wheels. I don't know what that is. Training wheels. And then you're holding the back of the bike. At some point, you let go. And you know without a doubt that they're probably not the bike riding prodigy that will get it the first time. You know for a fact they're going to fall. And you believe even that if they fall, they might even hurt themselves, no matter how much bubble wrap you put around them. They're probably going to get hurt, probably going to scrape a knee or two, or at least bruise an ego for falling. But what's the alternative? Forever to run after them holding the back of the bike? That's also an Ishkane Seder. You can't live like that. It's also not, not, not sustainable. So God says to Moses, guess what? We're at a brand new point in time. And it aligns perfectly with going into Israel. Because going to Israel, guess what's not going to happen? Mana from heaven. Be'er Shamirim, the well of Miriam is going to dry up. You're not going to get the, the clouds of glory anymore. Guess what? You're going to have to work for a living. It's now, now you're going to have. So stage two of the. Jewish people's existence. I mean, I would say we became a nation at the Exodus. That's stage one. Stage two begins right now, Shlach. This week's Torah portion is stage two. What is stage two? Now you guys make decisions. Now you guys own it. You're get, you, you make the call. So God tells Moses, you're coming to me for advice. How about you decide? That's my advice. You make a decision. God knows it's going to blow up. First of all, because God knows everything. But even the parent knows the kid's going to fall. You still let go. Because what's the alternative? Hold on forever? Ne there's never going to be any growth. 
you know, holding on forever, I, I, I always come back to the giving tree. It's like the giving tree. It's like the tree that consistently tries to fix everything. And that's, does it, it's not the healthiest approach. I mean, it's an intuitive approach. I, I, it, it's easier, I think. I mean, I don't know if it's easier. It's comforting to try to try to make sure that your kid never falls. I think there's definitely an attraction there. You know, there's definitely, um, you know, it's, there's a pull, but then, but then what's the alternative? I don't know. Anyway, um, good. So that's what's going on. Shlach lecha, shlach lecha. You said, why? God ran out of opinions? No, because God wants, wants us to make the decision and wants us, not wants us to fail, but maybe wants us to learn from our mistakes because that's how growth happens. So this is now Jewish people, Am Yisrael, nation of Israel 2.0. This is no longer 1.0 is top down, 2.0 is you guys are making the call. By the way, it doesn't mean that God has no opinion anymore. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have expectations. Again, like parenting, you have opinions and expectations, but you're giving space for the child to, 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 to grow and mature and to, to become an adult. That's what's happening. The Jews, to use a modern term, at least modern as of a few years ago, the Jewish people were about to start adulting, right? We're beginning to adult, using that as a verb, right? Beginning to adult. And when you start adulting, you make mistakes. That's the way it works. All right. Um, hope this makes sense. Back inside, let's do some more Rashi's. Uh, Moses sent them, oh, by the word of God with his consent. See, Ra Rashi is making sure we understand how both are true. They were sent by the word of God. Moses sent them by the word of God. That means with God's consent. God did not stop him. Remember, God thinks it's a bad idea. Oh, it's a bad idea. God, God knows the potential for this to get derailed, and God obviously knows the future that it will get derailed. But he still doesn't stop him, Moses, from sending them. Why? Because that would be controlling the situation. And God is letting go. Even God can let go. Can you imagine? We should also be able to let go a little bit for the benefit of others. All were men of distinction at that point in time. This is, by the way, this is very important. Rashi points out. Whenever the word anashim, as I pointed out, kulam anashim, they're all men, but they're different words for men. Ish, um, adam, and enosh, anashim. Whenever the word anashim is used in scripture, it denotes importance. At that time, listen to this. At that time, they were virtuous. In the Hebrew, va'isa shah, at that time, kesherim hayu, they were kosher. See that word kosher? Kesherim, kesherim, they were kosher. They were virtuous. They were okay. They got corrupted later, but at that point, they were all indeed men of distinction. Now, Moses, then the Torah goes through the 12 uh, tribes, the 12 um, representatives, the 12 scouts, one, one per tribe. And then the Torah told us something interesting, as we read before, that Moses did a quick name change for one of them, for Hosea, the son of Nun. He calls him Yehoshua. He adds a Yud. Rashi says, what's going on over there? He prayed on his behalf. Moses prayed for Joshua. And what was the prayer? May God save you from the counsel of the spies. And that works in the Hebrew because the name Yehoshua is a compounded form of Ka Yoshiacha. Yehoshua is Ka Yod Hey, which is the two letters, two of the letters of God's name. Yod Ke Yod Hey, Hashem Yoshiacha should save you. May Hashem, may God save you. From what? From the counsel of the spies, which now reveals another layer to this. You ready? Even Moses was concerned because Moses, before Josh, before Hosea heads out, he says, by the way, I'm now calling you Yehoshua. May God spare you from, their, from, from the counsel of the spies. What that means is even Moses was suspicious something may go down god is suspicious well god knows that it's not going to end well moses is concerned that it might not end well and still it's important that this happen growth does not happen maturity cannot happen without making decisions without making mistakes without falling down and scraping some knees that's the way it works if you learn how to ice skate you're going to fall 
you learn how to ride a bike, you're going to fall. If you play football, you're going to get hit. Maybe that's something else. Anyway, the point is like this. If you're, if you're, if you start a business, you're going to get challenged. You get, you're going to hit challenges. That's the way things work in life. Moses doesn't stop it. God doesn't stop it. And the narrative continues back inside. Moses tells them to go up in the south. This was the inferior part of the land of Israel. Moses tells them to start off in the worst part of the land. Why? Because this is the custom of merchants, salesmen. They show their inferior goods first, and afterwards they display their best. Like, well, you can get like a jewelry salesman, right? Like, Here's here's a here's a ring, okay? Or you can go with bam, 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 and then they pull out the good stuff, right? So Moses was trying to get them excited about Israel. So he's like, check this out. They'll be like, not bad, and then they'll go to the other part of Israel, like, whoa, this is amazing. As opposed to starting off on on at the on, on a high and then kind of going to worse places, then you end with a bad flavor in your mouth. So start you know start low and 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 build up from there. Some good salesmanship. Rashi says, check out, Moses tells the spot, tells the scouts, check out what kind of land it is. Some countries rear, rear strong people, and some countries rear weak people. In other words, just the way it is. In some lands, you have strong people, some lands not. Some produce large populations, some produce small populations. Interesting how it's attributed to the land, almost, the country itself. But that's the way it is. Are they strong or weak? He gave them a sign. Moses gave them a sign. If they live in open cities, aha, listen to the counter uh, intuitiveness. If they live in open cities, not fortified, it is a sign that they are strong since they rely on their might. They don't need walls because they're strong. And if they live in fortified cities with high walls and fortresses, it is a sign that they are weak and they need those protections. Are you with me on this? Does it make sense? If they're living open, they're confident. If they're living closed up, a little bit scared. Are they in camps? Camps are cities which are exposed and open, unwalled. Is it good? Is the land good? Possessing springs and other good and healthy water sources. What about the water supply? Does it have trees? Does it have a tree? Does it have a worthy man? Ah, Rashi says, it's not a physical tree. It means, does it have a worthy man who will protect them with his merit, like a tree? Does it have a tzaddik? Are there any tzaddikim there? And they say, he sent them when the first grapes begin to ripen, the season in which the grapes begin to ripen in their first stage of growth. Remember, this was Sivan time. So right around this time of year, maybe like a few weeks ago, like around this time of year. Okay, let me pause here for a moment and check in with you guys. Everything makes sense so far? Yes, sort of. Okay. What I want to do is go to the next reading because the next reading is where it gets interesting and where the drama continues. Okay. Here we go. I, we're not going to do the whole, the whole second reading. We're going to do um, probably until chapter 14. And by the way, if, if, if you are um, as Meshuggah as I am about some details, then you can probably tell me whether this font is the typical font or a different font. Where it says Numbers chapter 13. That's a serif font. That looks different. I believe that it's typically sans serif. Yeah. Like a computer font. To me, yes. this looks like a typeface, more of like a, you know, something that you would type out. Um, for print as opposed to online web. And I don't believe that by the road typically has that font. Why does it matter? The answer is it does not. It's Mine a, looks the same. As usual? Mine looks the same as the one before. That it, Mine doesn't look like that font. Okay. Because yours looks like, to me, it reminds me of a little Times New Roman. With that oh, one. you're saying you have it open elsewhere and it's different on your computer? Yes. Now we're getting into conspiracy territory. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's not the first time this has happened. I received my own email a few days ago and all my yeah. thoughts were this. And I, I went to the, the lady who said, who, you know, designs and sends out our emails. And I'm like, 
what's up with the font? And she's like, it's fine. I'm like, no, it's not. And she sent me a screenshot from her end. And she's like, it's fine. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Interesting. Maybe there's a certain font that my computer is reading a little wonky. All right. Who knows? Anyway, none of this is relevant to the Torah portion, but it's just in my head. Numbers chapter 13. So now we have a mission. We have the people. We have the, you know, we have the task. And here we go. So the Torah says, so they went up and explored the land from the desert, from the desert of Zin until Rechov at the entrance to Hamas. Right? They went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin, Zin until Rechov at the entrance of Hamat. Hamat. They went up in the south and they came to Hebron and Hebron and there were Achinam, Sheshai, and Sheshai and Talmai, the descendants of the giant. We're, we're going to get into Rashi's and all this. Now, Hebron, Hebron had been built seven years before it's so on of Egypt. A little factoid that is relevant as Rashi points out. They came to the Valley of Eshkol. And they cut a branch with a cluster of grapes. Remember, it was uh, the grape season, ripening grape season. They carried it on a pole between two people. That's a lot of grapes. And they also took some pomegranates and figs. They called that place the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster Eshkol. The children of Israel cut from there. Eshkol means a cluster of grapes. They called it the Valley of the Cluster of Grapes because that's where they got the cluster of grapes from. All right, so that's where they went. So these verses, 21 through 24, describe their scouting the land. Then they came back, verse 25. They returned from scouting the land at the end of 40 days. So all of that, this little montage of one, two, th of four verses, 21 through 24, that little montage was, you know, if, we, if this was a movie, we would see them, you know, I don't know. 40 days, various places, you know, taking pictures, you know, hanging out on the beach, cutting some grapes, going to a restaurant. I don't know what, the, whatever they were doing. Well, then they came back at the end of 40 days. So they were there for 40 days. That will be very significant as we'll see. Well, they went and they came, which is a weird expression. They went and they came. By Yelchu Vayavoyu. They went and came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the desert of Paran. They came back to headquarters, to Kadesh. That's the city. They brought them back a report. They brought a report back to Moses and Aaron, as well as to the entire congregation. And they showed them the fruit of the land. So they came back with a report and with samples. They told him and said, we came to the land to which, you, to which you sent us. They said to Moses, but everyone's gathered. Moses, Aaron, the people, and this is to Moses. We came to the land to which you sent us. And indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. It's lovely. However, however, however. You ever, you know, you ever have that, 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 that feeling when somebody tells you something that you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop? They're like, it's just being set up in a way where you're going to get up. But, or however, it's exactly what's going on. They said, Moses, the land is beautiful. It's the milk and honey, and this is its fruit. And just, wh where are you going with this? However, FS... In Hebrew, Ephes. However, the people who inhabit the land are mighty. And the cities are extremely huge and fortified. And there we saw even the offspring of the giant, which, by the way, we talked about before, right? We even named them. Achiman, Sheshai, Talmai, the sons of the giant. Yeah, they met, they met the sons of the giants. Giant. So the land is beautiful, but the people are mighty. The cities are huge and fortified. And there were giants there. 
By the way, we're not done yet. The Amalekites dwell in the Southland. The people knew Amalek. Amalek was the first nation that attacked the Jewish people. There had already been at least one, if not more than one, battle with Amalek. Amalek was already an enemy of the people. The Amalekites dwell in the Southland. That's to get people a little uh, anxious. While the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountainous region. The Canaanites dwell on the coast alongside the Jordan. At this point, they're name dropping. All these people, all these nations, all these kings, all these. All in Canaan, all in one area of land. And it's clear where this is headed. They haven't yet stated a conclusion. But at this point, it's clear where this narrative, where this report is headed. I mean, they came back and they said, yeah, the land is great. There's a lot of good food. However, people are strong. Cities are fortified. There are giants. I'm Malik. Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Canaanites. Yeah. At this point, Caleb, one of the 12 scouts, he steps in. Here's what you need to know. Of the 12 spies or 12 scouts, two of them, two of them came back faithful to the belief that it could happen, that God will make it happen, that God will, that they had nothing to worry about. Caleb, right here, verse 30, and Joshua, the one that Moses changed his name from Hosea to Joshua. The one who would ultimately become the successor of Moses and lead the people into the promised land. Yeah, he was, he remained true to the mission. Caleb also. Caleb silenced the people to hear about Moses. Because the people were the spies, the other, the other 10. And they were talking smack about Israel and about the possibility of, of doing it. So Caleb silences the people to hear about Moses. How? He, he, he uh, jumps in and says, and you know what else Moses did? To try to get them to think that he's about to drop some more juicy gossip. And then he says, he makes a, a 180 degree turn. And he said, no, we can surely go up and take possession of it for we can indeed overcome it. He interjects the, um, the positive conclusion. He sees where the scouts are headed and he says, no, nope, you guys are wrong. We can do it. We can do it. We can surely go up and take possession of it for we can indeed overcome it. But the man who went up with him said, no, you are wrong. We are unable to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. That should be an end quote. We need another quotation mark right here. It should be the end of the quote. They, the spy, the 10 scouts, spread an evil report about the land which they had scouted, telling the children of Israel, they, they kept on going, the land we passed through to, inhabit, to explore is a land that consumes its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in, our, saw in it are men of stature, consumes its inhabitants. We are goners. They're men of stature, strong people there. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, Descended from the giants. In our eyes, we seem like grasshoppers. And so we were in their eyes. Essentially, there is no shot. There is no chance. How do the people react? Well, the people, the entire community raised their voices and shouted. And the people wept that night. But we're going to stop here. We're going to go back to Rashi. Because what we've seen so far is enough for us to get a picture of what goes down with the spies what goes down with this, with this incident? They go and they scout for 40 days. They come back, beautiful land. The physical beauty is great. The food is great. People are too strong. The cities are too fortified. There are giants. We're grasshoppers. It's done. Caleb tries, valiant, say, no, we can do it. The lonely voice in the crowd. No, we can do it. We can do it. Drown out. By the shouts of fear, fear mongering, fear mongering, and, uh, and, and the cries and the screams of the people, protests, and, uh, and, and 
sense of helpless, helplessness. At this point, the fate is sealed. This generation will not end up, as we'll see as the narrative continues, this generation will never enter that land, save for the two people, the two scouts that remain true to the mission or that remain faithful in their mission, Caleb and Joshua. Those are the only two that will ultimately 40, 39 years later enter the land, cross that border into Israel. Everyone else, the men are done. I need to share with you one more insight. I'm going to share more than one, but one more now and then more later or more soon. There's, there is a commentary. I'm forgetting who says this. What was Moses' mistake? Shlach lecha anashim. The fact that he sent men. Had he sent women, this would have never happened. Because as we know, and as I've mentioned countless times, the Jewish women never, not in Egypt, not when they faced the sea, not when they faced, uh, not, not at the time of the golden calf, at no point in any of these narratives, collectively did the women lose faith and trust in God. On the contrary, they always encouraged their husbands in matters of faith. And so there is a commentary that says, you know what the problem was? They sent anashim, they sent men. And men, that's what happens. Had they sent women, oh, this would have never been an issue. They would have come back with a, a, with a faithful report, and that would have been it. Um, I mentioned this, by the way, anecdotally a few weeks ago, maybe several, I don't know, a while ago, when we read the Torah portion about the uh, splitting of the sea. And it says that Moses sang with the men, after the sea split and the Egyptians drowned, so Moses sang a, a song of thanksgiving to God for the salvation. And then it says Miriam also sang the song with the women along with the tambourines. Tambourines, who where'd they get tambourines from? It says that they were so sure that God would, would, would produce more miracles for them and that they were going to have an opportunity to sing and dance and, and, and thank God. They brought the tambourines from Egypt with them for the next, for the next miracle. So the level of faith of the Nashim Tzikonias, of the righteous women, shows no, no bounds. They never donated for the golden calf. They never were involved in questions of faith. And in this case, Shlacha Nashim, they sent men to do a job that simply uh, that they simply couldn't hack. The men got too scared, and they panicked. They blamed God. They blamed Moses. They blamed everything else. They blamed giants. And, uh, and that's, that's the way it worked. Okay. Let's do a few quick Rashi's. I know it's a little bit late. We're going to do a few quick Rashi's and we're going to close it out. All right, let me share my screen. We're not going to do enough Rashi's here, but I feel like I'm going to do a few highlights. Um, number one, it says he, they went up in the south and he came to Hebron, to Hebron. Who's he? Rashi says Caleb went there alone. Hence the singular he. Why did he go to Hebron? to prostrate himself on the graves of the patriarchs in prayer that he not be enticed by his colleagues to be part of their council. He davened, he prayed at the gravesite of Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and, and um, Rachel. He prays there to be spared from the evil counsel, from the counsel of his colleagues. He also could sense that they were going to go sideways and therefore, he said, please, please protect me from not getting caught up in this whole mess. Thus, it says, Deuteronomy, I will give him Caleb the land on which he walked. Caleb received Hebron. They gave Hebron to Caleb ultimately when he entered the land because that's where he prayed to be spared from this fate. I'm going to skip a few rashes. Again, I'm only getting to the, to the core of, of, of this. They carried the, 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 uh, the cluster of grapes on a pole between two people. Rashi, from the implication of what it says they carried in the plural on a pole, do I not know that it was carried by two? So what does between two tell us? The answer is with two poles. How is it done? Eight of them took a cluster of grapes. One took a fig and one took a pomegranate. That's 10. Joshua and Caleb did not take anything. For the intention of the others was to present a slanderous report, namely, just as its fruit is extraordinary, so its people are extraordinary. They're like, wow, the fruit is massive. Can you imagine how big the people are? 
that was their that was their angle. Even when they showed how good the fruit was, it was like it's freakish. This fruit is is weird. It's massive. It's not normal. That place, it's not normal. It's massive people eating massive fruit. We're gonna be like grasshoppers. We're gonna be like ants to them. There's, this is we have no chance. That was their agenda. So uh, Caleb and Joshua didn't participate in the whole fruit fiasco. Um, okay, let's continue. Um, they returned from scouting the land at the end of 40 days. Rashi says, but does not the land measure 400 parasangs by 400 parasangs? Um, and an average person's daily traveling distance is 10 parasangs. Thus, it takes 40 days to walk from east to west, and they traverse its length and breadth. In other words, it would take them 40 days to walk sideways, not plus up and down would be more time. So how did they do it so fast? So Rashi says, beautiful idea. Since it was revealed before the Holy One, blessed be he, that he would sentence them with a year for every day. 40 days of scouting equals 40 years of wandering. So he shortened the way so that they cover ground more rapidly. Imagine if it took them 100 days. Uh, the punishment would have to be 100 years. So God says, all right, I have Rahmanas on you. I have mercy on you. Knock it out in 40 days. I'll make your journey go faster. And that's it. Um, yes, 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 yes. They came back with an evil report. And by the way, this is one point I want to mention. And we're going to close it out. Give me another maybe minute and a half. It says they came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the people. Since when does a spy bring a report back to the people? What is this? What is this? Is WikiLeaks? What are we doing here? Right? The scouts are sent by Moses to check out the land and they come back and call a press conference that everybody. Sh since when does a military operation, since when does that intelligence go public day one? It stays classified. Why did they go to the people? Because of their evil intentions. Their intention was to get everybody afraid, to get everybody anxious, to get everybody in a panic. So that everyone would say, no, we're not going. That was their intention. And so they didn't go to Moses and say, here's the information. You know what a spy does? A spy goes to the general, I don't know, whoever sends the spy, goes to the head spy, if that's a thing, and says, here's the intelligence. You figure it out. They don't make their own conclusions. I'm a spy, so I can tell you what I think. A spy. You have one job, report the facts. And then let the experts figure out what that means. Interpret the information. You're going to be judge, jury, and executioner. You're going to be the one to check it out, the one to interpret the information, the one to call the press conference, to whip everyone up into a frenzy, and cause a revolt against this whole plan to go into Israel. Slow golf clap for the spies. Thank you very much. What are you guys doing? That's way over your 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 orders. That's way above and outside the realm of what you were sent to do. That's a, um, what would be the right word for that? That is a total, um, not violation, but like, more than violation. It's a total like broach of their, of their mission. They totally decided to do their own thing. The perversion. Uh, perversion, yeah. I mean, it's a total, uh, yeah. Flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> uh, and it's such a great narrative. I just got to read one more Rashi. They said, yeah, the land is flowing with milk and honey. Rashi, any lie in which a little truth is not stated in the beginning cannot be maintained at the end. This is a lesson for liars. If you want your lie to be believed, make sure it has enough truth to make it believable. So they come back and say, look, it's a beautiful land. They had to say something true before they then gave it the old spinorama. So again, a lesson to liars. Make sure it's plausible enough to be believed. If you're running a con, again, not that anybody should, but if you're running a con, you have to have enough plausibility for it to be believed. If it's totally outlandish, it's probably not going to be believed. You have to have a center, at least a center, an initial center on some element of truth. Really, Ari, right. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a good Rashi on they went and came. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Rashi says they went and came just like they came back with a negative report. So too, they went out initially with an, with evil intention. 
the the challenge of that Rashi, I skipped it because of the challenge is how do we reconcile that with the other with the earlier Rashi that says that they were kosher, they were kosher when they went when Moses sent them out, they were at that time they were kosher. So how can we say that they were kosher and they had evil intent when they went out? Like, is were they kosher? They had evil intent. It's explained. There are commentaries that explain it, but I, I wanted to leave that maybe tomorrow we'll we'll do a deep dive into that. The Rebbe has a lot of. I mean, the Rebbe has just numerous insights on this whole story, which again, we'll do tomorrow. I just wanted to get, kind of get our feet wet. Um, so let me just quickly look here and see if there's any more Rashi's that I want to mention. Um, okay. Yeah, one more Rashi. They said um, to the people, no, we are unable to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. We. Rashi says, no, not we, he. We could also mean he with a capital H. They said this in reference to the Most High as it were as if to say the people are stronger than he. Even God cannot allow us victory, cannot grant us victory against these giants and these fortified cities. Why, I can't. I can't hold myself back. One final one. In our eyes, we seem like grasshoppers. And so we were in their eyes. And the Rebbe says, this is the classic, as the Rebbe coined it, grasshopper syndrome. In our eyes, we were grasshoppers. And so we were in their eyes. The other person looks at you as you look at yourself. If you look at yourself like a grasshopper, then they're going to look at you like a grasshopper. And this is not only a message for the people, but for the spies back then, it's a message for us. If you want others to respect you, you got to respect yourself. If you want others to respect Judaism, you got to respect Judaism. If you want others to respect your practice of Judaism, you got to respect it. If you feel defensive, then others will sense the weakness and pounce, God forbid. All right, no one should pounce. I'm just saying that the more confident we are in everything in our life, including our spirituality, the more respect that others will, will grant us. If we look at ourselves like grasshoppers, then that's how the other will look at us. The Rebbe said this often about Israel and its position in the world. Israel is afraid of world, has many over the years, has been afraid of world opinion. If we you know, prevent terrorism, if we, you know, strike back, whatever, what's the world going to say? Is that, okay, if you're afraid, then you'll, then, then, then you're weak. And if you're weak, then everyone's going to push you around. And that's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So be strong, be confident. Others will take you seriously. It's a message for all of us individually and collectively as a people and for Israel, etc. Don't be a grasshopper. Be a warrior. I guess it's the opposite of a grasshopper. All right, that closed out for today. Thank you for indulging me for a few extra minutes. And uh, tomorrow we're back on same bad time, same bad channel. This is one of the greatest and most tragic, of course, stories in the Torah. But the the the, the amount of less life lessons is just it's, the sheer number of lessons is staggering. So I'm excited about this week. I'm excited that you're here with me. Looking forward to seeing. Can I ask you a question? Yes, Faith, for sure. Yeah, uh, if if they were so uh, afraid of these people that they saw then how, how come nothing happened to them and they were able to come back i skipped that rashi rashi says when they said um, i think it's a rashi when they said it's a land that consumes its inhabitants you know what i'll share it with you i'll share it with everybody check take a look at this rashi they said the land is a land that consumes its inhabitants rashi says wherever we passed we found them burying dead people were dying left and right Rashi continues, the Holy One, blessed be he, intended this for good, to keep them occupied with their mourning so that they should not notice the spies. Basically, God caused a lot of people to die in those 40 days so that everybody was dealing with burying their dad and the grief in the mourning, and no one noticed these 12 people kind of touring the land. So they were preoccupied with death, and so they, the spies came back and said, you know what's going on? Everyone's dying all over the place. It's terrible over there. And meanwhile, they took something that was intended for their protection and they twisted it around as something that shows how bad the place is. But to your question, how did, how were they not noticed? How were they not crushed? It's because God caused essentially distractions. Um, there's another word for that. God caused um, whatever, distraction. Okay, all right, that's it for today. Any other questions, comments before we close it out? Diversions, that's the word I'm looking for. There were diversions. I have a qu one more question. Yes. 
Uh, the 40 days. They were gone the whole 40 days. Well, Correct. does that mean 20, 20 going and 20 coming back? Yeah, it would have been. It would have been. It, somehow, yeah, the full circuit was 20. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it could have gone, you know, north, south, east, west, whatever. By the time they got back, it was 40 days. All in. Yeah. It includes okay. the return flight, basically. All right. Great to see you all. Uh, great to study together. Pleasure, pleasure. Olia and Sarah and Faye and Mark and Joy. Love Thank it. You. See you guys That's tomorrow. Cool. Take care. Zaygesund. Thanks. Bye.